Well, good evening, everyone. Um, if you would, uh, take out your Bibles this morning and turn with me uh, to the book of Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 2 is going to be our focus text, starting in verse 8 and going all the way down to verse 13. Um, that is chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. Uh, but before we get started, let me uh, pray for us and allow ask the Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts as we receive the word. Dear Holy Father, I thank you so much for uh, this time, this word that you have given us, this special revelation that you have imparted to your people. I pray that we would be attentive to it now, and that we would uh, always uh, draw near to it, Lord, that we would seek in it uh, all the truth that there is for the Christian walk in life. I pray that we would take it seriously and we would... Uh, hear its call, Lord. I pray that you would be with me as I deliver uh, the word this morning. Uh, may I diminish, may you increase, Lord, and may you, uh, your son, Lord, be ultimately upheld uh, as the uh, one God, uh, the one salvation mediator for all of us here today. We ask all these things in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Well, Second Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. This is the word of God. When a soldier is fighting, he must know why he is fighting. Men in the trenches must be willing to die, let alone the hundreds of other tasks that they have to complete on a daily basis just to go on and continue fighting. If they don't know what they are committed to, they'll likely desert, abandoning the mission that they originally set out on. In this passage, Paul is going to give us the why behind the suffering that he goes through for his proclamation of the gospel. But maybe your view from last time, we talked about many weeks ago now at the beginning of this letter that Paul wrote this to Timothy at the end of his ministry as he was in prison in Rome awaiting execution. And he sends this to young Timothy to comfort him, to assure him that the gospel that he was preaching was the gospel that his forefathers believed. It was the same faith that Abraham, that Isaac, that Jacob had. That even though there are some naysayers out there that said, No, young Timothy, you have betrayed the faith of your fathers. Paul said, No, this is the same faith. Christ is the same one that they were looking forward to. He then went on to encourage Timothy to not be ashamed of that gospel. He said that even if Paul was suffering for it, and even if he, young Timothy, may have to suffer for it, that this gospel was worth suffering for. And even if that suffering made the world perceive it as something that was a failure, that indeed it was not, as we will see here in this passage as well. He then went on to give Timothy three analogies for how he ought to live as someone who was proclaiming the gospel, someone who was fighting for the gospel, he said that he should live as a soldier fighting a battle, as an athlete in a competition, and as a farmer working in the fields. Farmers must work tirelessly in the sun. Athletes must compete according to the rules, and soldiers must fight even if the battle seems lost. Yet we know that Christ has already won in his work on the cross and continues to lead us to the final victory. In today's passage, Paul will bring us back to the theme of suffering for the gospel. But he will further explain to Timothy why we suffer for the gospel. There are three reasons that he shows us here. 
in verses 8 and 9, he, says, he shows us that he suffers because of the power of the word of God. The word of God is not bound. In verse 10, he says that he suffers to see the elect through to their final destination, to see them enter into eternal glory. And in verses 11 through 13, he says that he suffers because of the nature of Christ to whom he is united. Christ cannot deny himself. So let us jump in to the text, starting in verse 8. Remember Jesus, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Here Paul brings us back to Christ. Christ crucified and resurrected is at the heart of the gospel, and Paul is keen on reminding Timothy of this. But he is also keen to bring us back to a theme that he's been talking about for quite some time, the legacy that stands behind him, the legacy that stands behind the gospel. Jesus is the offspring of David. Just as Paul spoke of the faith that Timothy had being the same as that of his forefathers, Paul highlights this again here by showing that Jesus, though God Almighty, is also a man who descended from the great king of Israel himself. Of course, there is more to it than that. The fact that Jesus is the offspring of David is the very fulfillment of the covenant that God made with David. In 2 Samuel 7.16, God says to David, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The natural question that we may ask in hearing this promise is, well, didn't the line of kings fail? There is no longer a descendant of David on the literal throne of Israel. Did this mean that God is lied? Of course not. God cannot lie. While God did bless the line of David for quite some time with the physical throne of Israel, despite their, inherit their insistence on turning towards idols and wickedness, the covenant he made with David was actually fulfilled in something or someone far greater. Christ being literally descended from David now sits on a throne from now until the end of time. The covenant that God made with David did not end and God did not lie. Christ is the content of the gospel. His work on the cross is the gospel for it is the work that atones for the sin that we committed. Paul says this explicitly in 1 Corinthians when he says, we preach Christ crucified. And this is why he speaks here in 2 Timothy of Christ's resurrection being that which he preached in his gospel. Without this, no man will see the Father. Without believing in the saving power of Christ's work on the cross in both his death and resurrection, no man can be reconciled to God. This is a message that is hard words for many in the culture to hear. And yet it is something that we must continue to proclaim day in and day out, is it not? And we must continue to hear ourselves day in and day out. For there is nothing that we can do to reconcile ourselves to God. Only in trusting fully for our salvation in Christ Jesus' work on the cross can we have any kind of reconciliation to God. But continuing on, in verse 9a, he says, For which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. Again, the theme of suffering comes up. As Paul describes, discussed before, suffering for the gospel is not something that we should be ashamed to do. Even though the world will look at this as a sign of failure, Paul is in prison, treated like a criminal because of the message which he was preaching. Many viewed the message as troubling, as something new, or even as something that inspired insurrection against Caesar because it proclaimed that Jesus is the Lord. So they attempted to put it down, to stop the propagation of the message of Christ. But could they stop the gospel? Could they stop its spread? 
Well, the second half of the verse gives us that answer. 9b says, But the word of God is not bound. Paul uses his own imprisonment as a contrast to highlight the power of the gospel. Though he is in prison and thus incapacitated, the word of God is not. Isaiah proclaimed the power of the word of God when he says that the word does not return void. Paul himself spoke of this power in Romans when he said, How are they, the unbelievers, to hear without someone preaching? And only a chapter later, in verse 316, Paul says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. The proclamation of the word of God is so valued in the Reformed tradition because the scriptures state over and over again the power of it. The word of God cannot be bound regardless of the intent of evil men. Many may try to imprison those who proclaim it, and others ridicule it and discredit it. Yet the wicked hearts of men cannot bind the scriptures. Yet often, I think we are prone to forget the power of the scriptures. The rallying cry of the Reformation was sola scriptura, by the scriptures alone. But why did this need to be said after 1500 years of the church's existence? Because man had grown enamored with his own traditions. Unless we think that we are past the need for a reformation, look around you. Does the modern world really believe that the word of God is not bound? Many in the Christian church do not even believe this. When they talk with unbelievers, they tend to put the scriptures to the side. When they talk, or many will ignore the scriptures entirely six days out of the week only using it for religious purposes. Do they not know that the word is not constricted to the things that we deem religious? It speaks to all areas of life. Let us not be so quick to neglect the thing that is the source of all truth. Remember the words of Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher from the 19th century, and he said this, the word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. All you have to do is let the lion loose, and the lion will defend itself. Stop relying on your own understanding and let the lion loose. And even if all seems lost, let us not lose hope. God used Paul in prison even here in 2 Timothy, but also we see this in Philippians. He was writing Philippians as well from a prison cell. And Paul said this in that letter, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. My Greek professor I uh, always loved this verse because he said it was in prison that even though Paul was captive, that he had a captive audience. The guards were forced to make sure he didn't escape, but he didn't want to escape. He wanted to preach the gospel to them as well. And we see in Acts, even jailers become saved and are baptized. Paul did not waste time, even in prison. He used it as an opportunity, and the gospel was proclaimed even there. And that brings us, though, to our second point. He was preaching a word, a word that was powerful, a word that could not be bound. But why was he preaching this word? He was preaching it to bring those who he was preaching to, to their final destination, to eternal glory. Look with me at verse 10. 
Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here we get that second why as to Paul's suffering for the gospel. He endures everything for the sake of the elect. This is what is imperative for those who would choose a life of ministry. Oftentimes men go off to seminary because they love theology. But it is this kind of love for the church that is necessary for the minister. Paul was willing to go to prison and even to be killed because he loved the church and wanted to see the members within her persevere to the end. He wanted to see the people saved. But saved to what? Saved to eternal glory. Glory here comes from, or the Greek word for glory here comes from the word that we now use in the word doxology. Glory is what a soldier gains when he comes home from war in victory. While Paul is calling us back to the soldier analogy that he used a few verses earlier, he's also pointing out a stark contrast. There is not much about a life, the life of an imprisoned missionary that many would consider glorious. Here he is rotting in a prison cell, awaiting execution. That's not the type of thing that the world heaps glory upon. That is not the kind of thing that we make a parade out of with big pomp and circumstance and make monuments in the squares for. Yet Paul is striving so hard because he knows that there is a greater glory to come to those who are in Christ. He is willing to forego earthly glory if it means that those whom he loves and fights for will receive eternal glory. And that brings us to the third point. He's going to say he wants them to be saved to eternal glory. And though he is the one who is doing the striving and suffering in prison, it is not ultimately him that is going to be saving them to eternal glory. Who is it? that saves? Who is it that is really in control here? Well, look down at verse 11 and we will find out. The saying is trustworthy. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. What follows here, and if you're in some translations, you may see the next few verses set off as uh, a different uh, font or a different uh, indent there that's to signify that many believe this to be an early Christian hymn and we see here a series of four conditional statements four if then statements encouraging us in the Christian walk and here we see in this first conditional Paul describes for us that glorious mystery which we call union with Christ now what is union with Christ the larger catechism gives us a nice, concise answer. In question 66 of the larger catechism, it says, What is the union which the elect have with Christ? The answer is, The union which the elect have with Christ is the work of God's grace, whereby they are spiritually and mystically, yet really and inseparably, joined to Christ as their head and husband, which is done in their effectual calling. This question is given before the questions and answers on justification and sanctification, the two most commonly thought of categories as it relates to salvation, and even before the question on effectual calling. Why? Because this is at the root of our salvation. We are in Christ, a phrase that Paul uses over and over again to describe the elect. It is from him that all benefits of salvation stem, and unless you are united to him, you can gain nothing. But how does this happen exactly? When we are called by the Spirit, a call which is required for salvation, yet a call which no man can refuse, we are unified to our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And thus Paul can say that we have died with him and we also live with him. Romans 6, 4 states this very clearly, saying we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Many may ask how the work of one man 2,000 years ago can affect us today, and here Paul is giving us the answer. Many of those who Paul wrote to in this letter had never seen Christ bodily. Timothy may not have seen Christ bodily. Yet Paul can still confidently say that what Christ accomplished did apply to his audience. Why? Because in their calling of regeneration, they were uni united to the person of Christ, and thus their sin was conquered in his death. They were born again, risen anew, and now can live to God because they are in Christ. Being in Christ will push them to endure. Which brings us to verse 12. If we endure with him, we will also reign with him. Calling us back to the notion of suffering that we are required to endure as Christians and to the fact that Paul has just stated that he is enduring much suffering, we see the end in view here. Just as Paul spoke of that future eternal glory, now he quotes this song in which we are given a glimpse of that glorious future in which we will reign with him. The scriptures speak of Christ as an older brother, and we, being the younger brothers, will share in his inheritance. We must persevere and suffer for a little while, finish the race, so that we might receive the prize. Of course, we know that this is not truly based on ourselves, on our works. Our salvation is a gift, a free gift of God. But to those who are saved, Though they are saved by faith alone, that faith does not come alone. The Spirit gives us the power to endure through the many trials that we will experience on this earth. In verse 12b, he says something very sobering. He says, if we deny him, he will also deny us. A warning here is laid. This is an echo of Christ's own words in Matthew 10, when he said, Whoever shall deny me, he will I also deny. This is not here for us to think that if we are not perfect, that we shall not be saved. Indeed, none of us are perfect. And Christ must impute his righteousness to us in order for us to be saved. A fact that has been highlighted already in the fact that we are united to Christ that we have died with him and we now live with him. And us being in him is what will bring us to eternal glory. Yet what Paul and Christ in the book of Matthew are getting at here is a solemn warning to those who would deny Christ before men. And it would seem that Paul is speaking of a final falling away, an apostasy, in which men who were never really saved, denied the faith entirely in the face of persecution. Up until this point, Paul has been exhorting Timothy, and by extension us, to not be ashamed of the gospel and to be willing to suffer for it. We know that Christ suffered much for us, even death on a cross. And we know that our reward is that we will reign with him, that we will enter into an eternal glory with him. If all that be the case, why would we deny him before men? Why would we not stand before men and claim Christ as Lord, proclaiming his death and his resurrection? Why would we not defend the hope that is in us? Let us be there, heavenly minded, not in such a way that we do little earthly good. For indeed we ought to pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Instead, let us remember the reason why we are enduring, and we will be strengthened to not deny Christ before men. 
but to endure the hardship placed before us for the sake of the gospel. Indeed, as we see the changing landscape of the culture now, more and more we see persecution coming from different sides, whether it be from the government, from on top, from different agencies, from different people on the internet. The word Christian is quickly becoming something that people do not want to be associated with. Let us be think of the brothers that Timothy would have been preaching to in Ephesus. The word Christian then was not something that many wanted to be associated with either. The word Christian then could get you in prison. The word Christian at that point could get you thrown into an arena filled with lions, could get you burned at the stake. And yet we see hundreds and thousands of men and women willing to give up their lives for the sake of this gospel. So as we look around at America and think, woe is us, everything is going terrible. And I agree, there are many bad things happening in the world around us. Let us look back to those generations past and the bravery that they showed and the strength the Spirit gave them and be encouraged to continue to press on, to fight, and to endure any hardship that God puts in front of us for the sake of the gospel. Now moving to our final verse. Verse 13 starts, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. In reading this, Paul switches the pattern on us. In the previous conditionals, we hear something that we expect to hear. If we deny, so will he. Yet here Paul is showing us just how faithful Christ is. Christ is not dependent on our faithfulness. He is faithful in spite of our faithlessness. We fall short day in and day out, backsliding and sinning all the time. Yet to the penitent, Paul gives an encouragement. Even when we are unfaithful, when we miss the mark, when we sin, Christ forgives if we repent. And he does not falter. He does not let go of us. We are weak, sinful humans who are faithless, yet Christ is faithful. Yet why? Is he faithful? Why can he be so steadfast in his love for us, even when we falter so? Well, the last part of 13 gives us the answer. For he cannot deny himself. This is the culmination of what Paul is talking about here. Why can we continue to endure hardship? Why is Paul so sure that his sufferings are not in vain and that those, who, those he suffers for will indeed see eternal glory? Why can we be so sure that though we are faithless, he remains faithful and steadfast? Because he cannot deny himself. The Christ to whom you are unified, believer, will never deny himself. He cannot lie. He is unchangeable. For I, the Lord, do not change, God said in Malachi chapter 3, and therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. It is this ultimately that is our comfort, our hope, our assurance. Our God does not change, and Christ cannot deny Himself. Do you believe this? Do you believe this when that soft, warm, spiritual feeling has gone cold and you don't feel like God is there? Do you believe this when your bank account is dry and you have hundreds of bills that you need to pay? Do you believe this when you fall short, when you sin, when you backslide? The God of this universe that has called you, believer, 
does not change his mind. If God was changeable, if he could go from one moment to another, changing the way in which he guides history, we should be sore afraid. For tomorrow he could smite us all. Yet he does not. We humans deny ourselves all the time. We lie. We go back on our word. We change. Yet God does not. And oh, what a blessing this is. So go away with this encouragement. We suffer for a gospel that is the very power of God. It is not bound. We suffer and endure so that we might taste to that eternal glory, a glory that will be unending in a time when all tears are wiped away and sin is done away with fully. And we suffer for a God, for a Christ, who cannot deny himself. The one who cannot deny himself is united to you, believer. Take heart and fight the good fight. Let us pray.